In this chapter, we're going to look at the CIA Triad Confidentiality, Integrity, Availability. You'll look at Security Definitions, TCP IP Basics, Malware, Network Devices and Sniffers, Wireless Standards, and Database Basics. As you can see in this picture, we have come a long way. We're looking at the growth of environments and security. I'm sure some of you are looking at this picture and going, what am I looking at? Lower left, I see a network card, but I don't recognize the connectors. That's rather odd looking. What's coax? Maybe the upper left, you're looking at that going, wow, that looks, I haven't seen computers that big before. Well, basically mainframes, computers used to take up large rooms. So quite a few of the systems on this screen are actually, you know, quite aged. We have the Apple II in the, in the lower middle. And essentially, our computer systems have grown. We've come a great, um, just a long way since the, you know, they've begun. And we've evolved to just great computers and small sizes. And we basically, it seems like everybody's got a computer these days in the home environment, which maybe we could not have imagined this back in some of these initial time periods. Can't even conceive that. But computers are all around us, and we're connected with Facebook and just a, a variety of social media. And with that, I think security has become more and more important. We have online banking now. We can potentially look at our health records online. There's so much we can do online. And so our companies have had to become more and more secure. And obviously the hackers have evolved along with us. And hackers have learned, and even young children have learned, how to you know, use computers and be maybe far more proficient than we ever thought we would be at such a young age. So since there's hackers around and people, and hackers are wishing to get into our networks, we have to go to great lengths to actually secure our networks because these days, computer systems are just all interconnected through the internet and there's great concern over our information getting out to those that we don't trust. Now when we think about security, the core of all security classes you hear is CIA. Confidentiality, integrity, availability. With confidentiality, think of encryption, keeping information where it's not readable by someone we wish not to read the information. Maybe it's our information at a hospital or a bank, and we do not want some stranger reading our confidential information, so we encrypt the information, which basically uh, puts it in a format that looks almost like a foreign language. It's basically all rearranged, and it looks like gibberish. And the only people that could read the information would be those with the decryption keys, the appropriate people. So our goal is to keep the information confidential, or maybe we even keep it confidential through uh, permissions. If you don't have the correct permissions to look at it, you cannot see it either and read it. So confidentiality, you're keeping the information for those that should not set their eyes on your information and make sense of it. So it's more, can they read it? Can they understand what they're looking at? Integrity, that gets into, can they manipulate the data? Uh, you know, unauthorized people. Of course, we want the authorized people to be able to manipulate the data, make changes to the data, because they are authorized to do so. But with this, only the approved persons and processes should be able to make these changes, not somebody else. And computer security, as you'll see in the cryptography chapter, hashing, as in MD5 or SHA-1, examples like that, hashing is done on data to verify integrity. It does not stop the information from being manipulated by an unapproved person, but yet it lets us know it has occurred so we know not to trust that data. So again, hashing algorithms like MD5 and SHA-1 and so on are usually related to integrity. Availability, with availability, we want our information to always be there, remain available when and where we need it. We would not tolerate, you know, if we're working with a particular bank online banking and say, oh, well, we're available some of the time, not other times. I mean, it would be unacceptable. If we're going to put our money in the bank in days like these where we expect to be able to purchase items when we want to, any time of the night or day, 
and we want to build a user debit card and tie it into our banking, we would not want to have to tolerate, well, well, we're unavailable from 12 to 6 a.m. You know, that would just be unacceptable. So we want constant availability, and we don't want hackers to be able to affect that availability so we cannot get into our banking or get into our health records or whatever it may be. So the CIA, Confidentiality, Integrity, Availability, are highly critical. So a little bit more on this. Confidentiality, secrecy, sensitivity, privacy, prevents unauthorized disclosure of data, protects sensitive data and processes from things like shoulder surfing is where I'm actually, if I was a bad guy, looking over your shoulder watching what you type or looking at what you have on your computer screen. And we would want to, you know, do some preventative measures to keep that from happening, possibly pay attention to who's near you. Plus, you could have some sort of, um, you know, screen filter on there. Social engineering. People can try to manipulate another person by being friendly or some sort of uh, generally manipulation or intimidation. Or maybe it's through email to try to get information out of them that they should have not given up. So we're always trying to keep information confidential, but really encryption is super popular for this. You see confidentiality uh, through encryption with virtual private networks, maybe even internally to protect against sniffing of the information and being able to read it. Remember the integrity? We're trying to keep our information accurate and complete. We want to prevent as much as possible unauthorized modifications. If we happen to be looking at hospital records, only people that are supposed to be modifying the hospital records should have that access. If a hacker is able to go in and manipulate our health records, that's a bad thing because they could say that we have cancer when we don't have cancer, say we have a disease when we don't have a disease or, or you know, whatever it may be. So we wish to protect our information from being changed by those that are not authorized to change it. Any sort of general manipulation. It could even be changing your security log. Availability. This is not really manipulating the data. It's making the computer system unavailable. Unusability. Timelessness. It uh, basically disrupts your service. If you happen to be a company like Amazon and uh, hackers were able to disrupt Amazon, it would obviously affect their reputation. It would affect their sales. They would lose money and maybe those hours that they were offline, which is hard to imagine, but you could pretend. And all this disruption is very negative to that business. We, we hope for, you know, uptime that, that never stops. I mean, we're always available. How, what could cause a lack of availability? I mean, it can be man-made, technical, or even a natural disaster. And of course, that's where disaster recovery comes in on the, the disaster part, like a tornado or a hurricane, something like that. It could be that a device failed, and we hopefully have fault tolerance. So if this device fails, another device takes over, whether it be a switch, a router, or maybe clustered servers. Or it could be hackers just trying to bring you down because you're the competitor, and we call this a denial of service. Approaching security holistically. It's really everybody's involved in forcing and guiding a culture of security. We have physical security, can't forget that. Physical security is a big part. If people cannot get into the rooms where the equipment exists, there is, you know, obviously much better likelihood of keeping secure. I mean, because when it comes to physical security, if you cannot ensure the physical security, much can be done to computers when people can just walk in the room with them and unplug them or, you know, shut them down, things like that. All right, so we're one to behave and be secure. Operational security, it's, it's all facets of security. It all goes together. These definitions we will see a few times through here. We have vulnerability, weakness in a mechanism that can mean threatens confidentiality, integrity, or availability of that computer system or asset. And a lot of times we have vulnerabilities because we lack some sort of countermeasure or control. Perhaps we needed to have the appropriate patching or the right antivirus updated. Okay. 
threat, someone uncovering a vulnerability and exploiting it. Some hacker, for example, found out that there was a vulnerability in Windows 2000 or Windows 2003 server, and they wanted to exploit it because they found that they could get into the system through that vulnerability. Risk, probability of that threat becoming real and the corresponding potential damages. So we could have a vulnerability, but as far as the risk, it's, it's kind of like how likely it is going to happen. You could have the same vulnerability in two different physical environments, and one environment may have lots of people around, maybe at a college, and maybe another environment is somewhere where there's quite a bit of a distance between the buildings, and perhaps the threat level is much higher in the college environments because there's people are so close to the systems and maybe they're the age group that they're more interested in hacking perhaps that your overall risk could be is could be more likely because that threat could become real more likely again the probability increases exposure when the threat agent that's could be the hacker exploits the vulnerability countermeasure you put something in place to try to mitigate or reduce the potential losses. We put antivirus on computers to, as a countermeasure, as a control, to try to reduce the likelihood of being harmed by a virus or a Trojan horse, some program like that, some form of malware. And as far as the definitions relationship, you, know, you can kind of see that they, all, they basically all tie together. And when, when they talk about safeguards, we are trying to put a countermeasure in place. And we, we can't really avoid every vulnerability we're going to have, but we do try to do vulnerability assessments and try to see what we have as far as vulnerability vulnerabilities go. And we try to assess what the threats are and see what we can do about it as long as it's cost effective, as we will see later. Next section, TCPIP basics. First thing we do in TCPIP, this is a very popular command where you actually use the command ping followed by an IP address. And what it's meant to do is you basically let you know if we have connectivity. So basic network connectivity can be tested using this. You would ping a live computer, a live host. So it sends out an ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, echo request packet and if that IP address is up and running, then you will get a message back and ICMP echo reply will be received. Now, you normally would get a reply back if they exist and everything is working correctly. These days, sometimes when we do pings, the reason they may fail may be because of a firewall, some sort of blocking that they're doing. And that's getting to be pretty common. Now, this is the OSI model. And you can see just kind of a glance of it and you see it is a seven layer model and all they're trying to do here is show how we can kind of correlate some of the different protocols to some different models. You hear the DOD model, Department of Defense model, sometimes you hear TCP IP model, but here they have the DOD model, which is basically a four layer model that maps beautifully to the OSI model. I prefer to stay with the OSI model because it's more granular and it actually breaks it down into seven layers instead of taking like application maps to session presentation application. Of course you can see transport is host to host, network is internet, and data link and physical is network access. So it's the same thing, it's just two perspectives of four layers or seven layers. And you can see some of the protocols within TCP IP that correlate and what layer they correlate to. The ones that sound like applications, like HTTP, Simple Network Management Protocol, FTP, you know, SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, and so on, you, you kind of map those more to the application layer, and you can see the port numbers on the slide. And when people use firewalls, they many times need the port number to do the firewalling or the filtering. The TCP and UDP are at the transport layer, also known as host-to-host -host layer. At the network layer, you can actually see the internet protocol, you can see the ICMP, which ping needs, the ping command requires ICMP if it's to get a reply back. It is like a messaging type protocol. And, we, and our address resolution protocol have always been nice for 
you know, resolving an IP to MAC address, which goes down to the data link layer. And of course, your network devices, you think of those as physical and data link for the most part. With TCP IP, you will see that everything seems to go off of ports. There's like these port numbers. So internet sites list port numbers and their associated applications. And uh, I'd say the IINA.org is probably one of the best ones. So even if I went and did um, port numbers, I think it would just come up with it. Here it is. Some are more readable than others, but it shows you here that port numbers, there's actually ranges. We have system ports, 0 through 1023. Those are the most common. User ports, 1024 to 49,151. And there's also dynamic or private ports, 49,152, 65,535. And just to look at a few of the more common ones, uh, FTP, you can see FTP data, port 20, FTP port 21, secure shell. Some of this we will talk about later. Uh, that's been a nice replacement for Telnet and secure and FTP sessions, 23 Telnet. So these are pretty popular. There's your email, simple mail transfer protocol, port 25. Okay. So it kind of goes on and on. This is just one source of some of the ports. It's not a complete list that I'm looking at right here. But that's one of the more popular ones at IANA.org because this, this shows you the well-known and registered port numbers. So it's kind of your main reference. Within the TCP IP protocol suite, we have a three-way handshake. Whenever you see an application need to have reliability, it uses TCP. TCP actually goes and does something like this. It says, uh, maybe I'm you, <laughs> and you is talking to the server. So you says to the server, synchronize. Basically, I'd like to connect with you. Can you work with me? And then the server is going to come back and say, synchronize, acknowledge, send, ACK. And with this, you're going to see that there's actually sequence numbers that are involved in the process too so we can keep up with the conversations and they're, they're basically counting and then the third phase is acknowledgement back so the synchronization basically says I'd like to connect to you and have a conversation the acknowledgement says yes I'm willing so you're seeing the synchronized go both directions with the acknowledgements going both directions so syn, synac, ac if you're using a tool like Wireshark, you would actually see the, the three-way handshake. There's you talking to the server, server talking back to you, and a final acknowledgement. If you're using Wireshark, it used to be Ethereal, and you really look at some of the TCP traffic, you could see these flags. They would be abbreviated. Uh, you'd mostly see synchronize and acknowledge, but you can find the others in there too. The sin and the ack, essentially, the member of the synchronize, so synchronize is sequence number, basically starts up the conversation. The acknowledgement means yes, I agree, acknowledges the sequence numbers. You could also see some of these others, thin, fit for finish, final data bit used there in a four tear, step teardown sequence, reset is where you basically close down the connection. Uh, non-gracefully is the way I would put it, without going through the four-step teardown sequence. It was a sudden abort, a, a sudden stop of the connection. Push, push data bit is used to signify the data in this packet should be at the beginning of the queue of the data to be processed. In other words, put me first. It says this needs to go first. Urgent, urgent data is used to signify there is an urgent control character in the packet that needs to be processed immediately. When mostly you see the sin and the act, those are really common. You can see fin, you could see some resets, sometimes these. Next section, malware. Malware is something we do not want on our systems. Malware comes in many forms. Uh, it would be foolish to not have some sort of antivirus on your system and potentially anti-malware product. 
In company environments, you most likely have a full-blown solution like McAfee, as, a, as an example. One of their, their products that would take care of you, you know, as a total product, not just parts. And in the home environment, we may not have a full-blown security product like work, but we would hopefully have an antivirus that would pick up most likely Trojan horse programs, uh, viruses, possibly root kits, but you know, malware is basically anything very undesirable to our system. Now looking through some of the more relevant ones, uh, worms are they're basically software that is going to reproduce on its own. It's a self-contained program. It does not need or rely on anything else. It's independent, but yet it's able to replicate or reproduce on its own and spread swiftly. So worms can be quite dangerous. Uh, logic bombs. You know, on television many times they'll talk about, a, they'll call it a virus, and they'll say that this virus is going to happen at midnight on a certain date. And really what they're defining is a logic bomb. But I'm sure if they said logic bomb on television, nobody would know what they're talking about. So a logic bomb, it is malware, it's code, but it will execute based on a date, time, or event. Trojan horse program, you have to be careful what you download. If you know anybody that loves to do the peer-to-peer -peer software and go to those torrent websites, BitTorrent websites, they're likely to get infected with Trojan horse programs. And what would happen is they're downloading a program that they really want that does most likely work. But it's been combined with an evildoer program. It's been combined with another program. So I don't know if it, they say program disguised as another program. More likely, I think it's the real program. But you have a, another like devious program combined with it, and they were saved as one unit. So when you get your program you wanted to download, you also get this back door to your system for a hacker to potentially find. And with Trojan horse programs, unfortunately, a lot of times there's keystroke loggers in there so they can log your keystrokes and, and you know catch your passwords because you typed them in. They can look at your screen, see what you're doing on your screen, upload and download. I mean, it's just a really bad thing. <laughs> now, a virus... Uh, you know, we get antivirus, and antivirus picks up way more than viruses, but basically a virus, it's a small application or code that infects applications. It, it does have a dependency, unlike worms. It does need another piece of software to latch onto, so it can travel with that piece of software or on that boot sector, whatever it may be. And with the viruses... I mean, they just basically, something you're, you copy to a friend, hey, you want this, and you may get a virus with the something you wanted. Uh, I would say viruses have grown way beyond this. I mean, viruses are just growing day by day. Uh, we could write this book today and say a certain number, and tomorrow it would be wrong because it continues to have more and more viruses and worms day by day. As far as some of the viruses, we have uh, macro viruses. Uh, you hear Microsoft Word and Excel have macro capability. Well, there's viruses based on that. That's why sometimes macros are turned off in Microsoft Word. Boot sector viruses, where malicious code is inserted into the disk boot sector. That's a, that's a nasty one right there. I've had those before. Uh, compression viruses initializes when you decompress the file. You have stealth viruses. It hides its footprints and changes it has made. Anything stealthy is trying to hide its presence in some way. It's, you know, trying to be stealth. Any sort of morphic is some sort of mutation. Polymorphic makes copies and changes those copies in some way. Think mutation, morphic. Multipartite can infect in, a, in different places. The boot sector, the file system, and of course... Sometimes you got to have self-garbling viruses modifies its own code to try to not be detected. So it can be pretty tricky. And just as a comment, I mean, if you're in a home environment and you don't have one of those full-blown products, it's just a full antivirus and everything else product, you could consider an antivirus plus an anti-malware product as well. You know, there's like, let's see, there's uh, Malwarebytes, there's SpyBot Search and Control, I haven't used that in a while. 
Um, so you know, you can use those in addition to your antivirus. You normally can only run one antivirus on a computer. You don't normally run more than one because they'll fight each other. But you could get away with right, uh, actually running an antivirus and a separate anti-malware product. Windows 8 comes with Defender, Windows Defender as an antivirus and then you could you know tack on like malware bytes if you wanted to in a home environment work environment again they most likely have you covered spyware now continuing with malware spyware software or hardware installed on a computer that gathers information about you and of course the bad guy could later on retrieve this information and you would not know this so spyware can come in hardware but many times it's in software it can be broken down into surveillance. I mean, there's surveillance spyware, advertising spyware. It's very important that we keep our security software up to date and we scan for information, things happening like this. And could even have a surveillance software to monitor employees' computer usage. I mean, you're always, you just get used to it. You're being spied on most likely. Some people will even cover their webcams on their computer, just like I have. <laughs> Because uh, it's, it's come out in the news before that is the uh, I think it was the FBI was able to actually turn on your webcam without the light coming on and you don't even know it. So you never know. Trojan horse programs we've talked about a bit, but remember that the Trojan horse again. It normally you you download a program. The reason I pick on BitTorrents is it's where people go out there to a pirate bay and and different. BitTorrents with the idea of downloading free software because they don't want to pay for that software. Well, you can sometimes get it free out there, but unfortunately it comes infected. So now you've just put something on your system, most likely a Trojan horse program, and you've got to get that off there because hackers can scan your system, scan your ports, and see if you're running various Trojans, and then they could potentially take control of your system. And, sp and spy on you and you know, see what you're typing, look at your computer. I mean, they have complete control. As you can see, it has, you know, obviously Trojan horses go back to, in, to history. And that's where they kind of came up with the name for Trojan horse programs on your computer. Backdoors, yes. When I think of Trojan horse programs, I think of a backdoor. Uh, also rootkits. Rootkits are related to this, but they're just much more much deeper into your system and most likely really need to reinstall. But with Trojan horse programs, there you don't know that when you download that piece of software that it came with this, but it most likely did come with the Trojan if it's illegal software, something you were supposed to pay for. Now hackers, or actually the hacker programmers, would put maintenance hooks in the software intentionally to be able to get into the software directly and access, you know, allow entry to code at specific points without security checks, but this was supposed to be removed before the software gets sold. Denala Service, DOS. Denala Service really comes in two forms. We have Denala Service and Distributed Denala Service. And the, the intention, you see in the first picture, well, it's not really the best picture. Let's see, if you had a bad guy attacking one guy attacking a system, we think of that probably more as a denial of service, but if you have many people attacking a system, it's more of a distributed denial of service. If it's just a one person denial of service, but when you see the picture on the right where you actually have, it starts out almost like a denial of service. The attackers infecting the zombies, that looks like a denial of service, but then the zombies are actually doing uh, basically draining the resources of other systems so there's many of them doing the attack that has just changed it to a distributed denial of service. Generally it seems like these days if it's one machine attacking another machine it doesn't seem to do a lot of damage from what I can tell. But when you employ many other machines what could really happen is you we could be out there people are playing with bit torrents and they get infected and they don't know that they have some software that could allow them to be controlled as zombies and these zombie systems are then being told when to attack an unwilling victim there and then suddenly we have a distributed denial service that you were part of and you didn't know you were part of so the lead system was really called the master or the it could be the attacker here and then the zombies were being controlled and as far as 
a little bit of preventative, you could consider some sort of filtering coming in or going out. Ingress filtering, thinking firewalling, or egress filtering, going out. Distributed denial of service, just showing some stories of when these have happened and it can continue on and on when you think of distributed denial of service attacks. It's, I mean, looking at this slide, you can realize they go back really far. And so it continues <laughs> with this and they can be pretty difficult on a company when they cannot be there for their legitimate clients. Their legitimate customers are obviously very aggravated that they were not able to access their banking when they wanted to. Oh gosh, my bank's down again. It has a denial, distributed denial of service. I think it'd only take one time before I would leave my bank over something like that. We expect, we have no tolerance, I guess, with this. We expect perfection these days because banking, for example, they're keeping our money. Network devices and sniffers. Packet sniffers, these are basically it's software that can intercept packets on a LAN. It, it records uh, the transmissions. It's able to look at the packets. You can take the packets and take them down to a very deep level, decode, analyze them. Sometimes called a network monitor or network analyzer. Maybe even wireless capability, Ethernet sniffer, protocol analyzer. Protocol analyzer is probably the most common one I hear. As far as software that we use, Wireshark is super popular. Its predecessor was called Ethereal. They can be used in good ways by network administrator types for troubleshooting. They can also be used by hackers. And when it comes to sniffing, I mean, we have passive sniffing. We can think back to when we had hubs. And basically sniffing traffic through a hub without injecting packets. So everything just kind of goes through it and what it sees, it records. Hubs have been basically replaced by switches. Active sniffing, you think of the days of switches, which was a layer two data link layer device of the OSI model, which means it understood what MAC addresses are. So active sniffing is sniffing traffic on your local LAN but in order to do that, packets must be injected that cause data to be rerouted to the sniffing machine. And essentially, connecting to a switch takes care of this. Okay, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems. Essentially, we, we have firewalls. Sometimes people will actually call these firewalls kind of depends on their functionality. We're going to look at some of this. Uh, firewall's first line of defense. We think of a firewall as something we can program to allow certain traffic through and deny other traffic. And we would create those rules. And we would have firewalls, as you can see in the picture, in different places. It's not like you have one firewall and that does everything. You could have firewalls at different uh, areas within your network. It's kind of like having a military base with the front gate that you go through and that's a security check you have to get through kind of like a firewall and then you may get to a given building and then you have to get through maybe there's some sort of security to get through through that building then maybe there's more security to get through to get into a given room intrusion detection systems can be considered somewhat of a defense uh, it's, it's more of detection it detects what looks like attacking traffic of a hacker and it, it notifies you. It's not perfect. False positive. Sometimes it will say something is an attack and it's not really. Intrusion prevention systems are like intrusion detection systems, except they are able to take it into their own hands. And if the intrusion prevention system says, I think I'm being attacked, it will simply stop the connection. So it's able to do something about it. As far as firewalls go, we can look through this slide, you can see there were different firewall types, different generations, generation one through generation five, and it's just kind of the evolution of firewalls. And it doesn't mean that we've stopped using, we'll say like generation three firewalls. We still have, or generation one, we still see that a great deal, even proxy. It's just different capabilities. And the idea of a firewall is to basically stop traffic 
from going through that meets a certain condition, for example, or allowing it if it meets a certain condition. The packet filtering is the simplest and least expensive. You could think of a simple Cisco router, one of the simpler ones that are set with access control list. You can create rules within that that spell out what can come through and what cannot come through based on simple things like IP addresses and port numbers. It's, it's effective, but not completely everything you need. Uh, we hear people talk about proxies or proxy firewalls. And th with this, traffic must go through that proxy, that proxy system. On the proxy firewall's IP address is exposed to the outside of the network. So when you look at the proxy, that's what they see. It's, it's kind of like protecting what's inside of it and what's inside your network because the proxy server is the only thing that the IP address that is actually seen on the outside. We would normally have some sort of network address translation where we're com converting the public IPs to private IPs. It is like a little middleman, it's true. Various types of, sort of the uh, proxy firewalls. A lot of times you don't hear the word firewall put with it, but it is kind of associated to be like a firewall. You could have ones that are more circuit level based. We're also looking at SOX, SOX characteristics here. So good for outbound internet access. Application layer proxies, that's the one I think most people identify with really, not the first two. And with this application layer, you can imagine, probably the, the real popular one is web surfing. So maybe it's being used for HTTP, going out to the internet. So they say one proxy per protocol is required. So super common, and it, obviously it covers more than just internet surfing that you might be using a proxy for. Stateful, a lot of times I, I've in the past have called this the best of the best, but it's not the absolute best, but it's a really good one. Many firewalls that want to step above, they don't really want to do proxy services, they don't really want to do uh, stateless or packet filtering ones, we've already, which we've discussed, it's the same thing. Uh, they want to use ones that are a little smarter. They're called stateful firewalls. And it's able to make decisions on more than just the IP address and the, the protocols or port numbers that you're running. It also is able to do historical comparisons with what packets have been sent beforehand and the condition and the content of the packets. And it basically puts together a table. They call it a state table. And it just has far more intelligence and it's more likely to pick up any sort of something that looks like more like something a hacker might do, something that doesn't look quite right. So these firewalls are, are far more intelligent. Dynamic packet filtering, it's like they put some of them together, a combination of application proxies and stateful inspection firewalls. So it's able to be reactive to pre-designed changes in situations, it is considered fourth generation. So if you can imagine putting together some of the nice features of the prox application proxy servers like HTTP offers, plus the, the ability to build a state table with, you know, with the state full inspection, you end up with a far more robust firewall. Kernel proxy characteristics are classified as a fifth generation firewall type. This is built more into the software itself runs in the kernel protected ring of a computer system. It's integrated with the operating system. Firewall placement, uh, it can be in a variety of places. Uh, firewalls are not just on the outside. It's not like a hard shell with a soft chewy center. Punch through the firewall and you're in. You don't want it to be that. You want to have the firewalls in many different places. So. You put it anywhere you think you might need to do some filtering because there maybe there's something trusted and something untrusted. You, of course, it's like a demilitarized zone, DMZ, and you can see multiple firewalls in those. You can decide where you want the firewalls to be, but there should be, you know, several firewalls. Showing off some placement, just kind of looking through these slides, you can see they're calling this a screened host, and effectively you can see in the picture the internet. And it kind of comes through, and goes through most likely a router, and then you have a firewall, and then you have your systems. So 
you think of it as a screened device filter and firewall followed by uh, you know kind of getting into the system and trying to protect the PCs loose look like servers on the inside so screening device filtering router screened host firewall so they're both screening I guess that's the point here you're, you're having a good bit of layering your router can actually act as sort of a firewall it does have that capability when you hear people say multi or dual homed we have more than two we have two or more interfaces and essentially if you did that to a PC you would have two network cards in there for example or if you wanted it to act as a firewall and a lot of times we call that multi we well, usually we call it dual homed and it just lets you know it's acting as a firewall in our picture we can see that that firewall has multiple connections I mean you can look at this picture here and you can see there's obviously an interface going to DMZ1 there's an interface going to DMZ2 it's got a connection going to the right and a connection going to the left so it's definitely multi homed those are all network interfaces and of course it would be you go through some sort of filtering to decide whether it gets passed through screen subnet buffer zones created by implementing two routers or two firewalls you could just like basically create a DMZ demilitarized zone you can see the firewalls sandwiching in the DMZ area so that's a really nice way to go wireless looking at wireless we have peer-to-peer -peer and ad hoc this is not quite as common usually you're using something called infrastructure which is an uses an access point but with this peer-to-peer -peer and ad hoc effectively I mean you can relate to the pictures there and so that makes sense but essentially you don't really have the central point you don't have the central management interface you could set up a computer and say I'm going to be the moon base wireless network we just made that up moon base wireless network and any of you that want to connect to me I'm called moon base so we could use that to try to transmit between a handheld device maybe it's an iPad and your PC and you could you know basically create wireless between you especially if you're nowhere where there's really a, like a router there's no D-Link or Netgear router to be a, a traditional ad hoc network I said that wrong infrastructure network so you've got an ad hoc and if you have a router or a you know have a router like a Netgear, Linksys, whatever brand you choose that suddenly makes you infrastructure mode okay with infrastructure mode you have a central point of configuration just like you if you in your home environment if you went to purchase a Netgear router brought it home and went in there and configured the encryption that you wish to have hopefully uh, WPA2 would be the very best and then you set it up all your devices would have to be configured with those same security settings and that would be infrastructure when you purchase these routers based on the date line that you've bought these most likely there were different standards now I don't find that the 802.11 standard 11a rather was really that popular it was pretty nifty though it had a great deal of speed at the time 54 megabits per second it used the 5 gigahertz frequency that was pretty nifty but I think in, in the States I find that most people started out on B that have been doing wireless for a while you can think of B as being kind of in the beginning and unfortunately it only went 11 megabits per second but it was a 2.4 gigahertz which is really popular for the frequency then we went up to the 802.11G and with this we stayed in the 2.4 gigahertz but we jumped up in speed to 54 so that was really great these days I think most people probably have G or N now they really give in a lot of talk on that last one but you can look in this chart and kind of get a little bit of a history not every letter you see here as far as the protocol column is truly represented in reality <laughs> I think you'll find historically most people you'll talk to they may have used B then they would have perhaps gone to G and then to N and you would not have seen necessarily any of the others but you can see you know historically what was out there and I guess the main specs that would probably be interesting would be the data megabits in the frequency now the 5 gigahertz frequency is not does not have the distance the 2.4 gigahertz frequency has 
the N standard, so nowadays we have the N standard, and with that it can do both frequencies, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So that's pretty nifty. Here's 802.11 N continued. Multiple input, multiple output. Uses multiple antennas to increase throughput and or reduce bit error rates. It is split into three categories here. And as far as capabilities, I mean, we really like it because it does have a better coverage area. Um, better speeds, actually. Let me go back to that slide and just check. Let's see, speed 248 megabits. I've seen some sources even say 600, although I think that's probably a little more realistic, the 248. But some, bo some uh, books will tell you 600 megabits per second. Some, sometimes you'll pick up a router and you look at the box and it has a specifications on it. It will actually even say 600. So it's kind of a, it varies on the speed there. And, and with this MIMO capability, it's even going to improve some of your other clients if you happen to have some older standards in the house, likely G. Database basics. With databases, when you think of what is a, what is a database, it's a collection of information or data that's stored in a computer system and it's organized with words like files, records, and fields. Fields is a bit of an older term I don't hear as much, but I'm used to saying it because I've been around <laughs> with databases for a while. Now, database management systems, these are the collection of programs that let you enter and organize and select data in the database. And there's different types of databases, relational, network, flat, hierarchical. And it's just how it actually organizes the information. Now, relational databases are super popular. Just giving you a little history here. Brands that are, are products you could recognize, probably Oracle, Microsoft's SQL Server. Those are probably the really big ones, and, and some others are listed there too. I have Microsoft Access, that's another one you might know. When you look at database, kind of like database terms, a really popular one is tables. It's a collection of data or data structure linked through relations tables are constructed of rows and columns. It kind of reminds me of a spreadsheet, sort, sort of, because you have columns and rows, and when you look at a table, it looks like that. A record set is a requested data, a subset of the entire row. You may have attributes. That term is used quite often. It could be a data type. It could be a currency, the date, characters. I mean, what type of data do, or do we have here that would help with the attributes domain a set of allowable values that an attribute can take again it could be if I'm currency maybe I only allow certain character sets such as dollar signs so databases are all around us it's important to know some of the terminology with databases they do have a process called data normalization and the idea of this is to eliminate any sort of duplicate or redundant data, or repeating groups or attributes, anything that's basically redundant. Trying to make your database not so repetitive, make sure it's efficient. With databases, you'll hear people talk about a language called structured query language, and it does not belong just to Microsoft. What the structured query language does is it lets you control the data from the command line, for example. Some popular ones might be, um, you know, Microsoft's SQL, or you hear people use, um, or my, MS, Microsoft SQL uses Transact SQL. Uh, Oracle has its own as well. You'll hear commands like update, delete, insert, and, and so on, drop, drop tables. It depends on which vendor you're using, what words you use. It's a language of its own. But very important and if you're ever going to be a like a vulnerability assessor or a penetration tester the more you understand of databases the better you would be in understanding the language with the structured query language an overview of database servers we know we have the database management system and externally we have web browsers or there may be some sort of a piece of software that's called a front end it's what the users would, would use to interact with your database, the database front end. We could be looking at views, and that can be programmed to spell out what type of information you wish the customer to see. 
we could have tables and the tables can be can make up the database essentially you could have multiple tables maybe it's a table of your product numbers and another one is of your customers and maybe you, you link all that together and of course storage level in Microsoft we have NT file system and you can do security with that we have access control list which is kind of a firewall can, can be considered a firewall or in this case uh, with the ACLs they're talking more about it's basically permissions they're, they're, the NTFS is a Microsoft specific way uh, of doing access control but then generically access control lists can be used to dictate permissions who has what type of permission so in this very long chapter we have looked at uh, the CIA triad the confidentiality integrity availability security definitions a little bit about TCP IP basics malware viruses worms Trojan horse programs and so on network devices and sniffers a little bit of hubs and switches wireless standards uh, BGNA and database basics